All right. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Uh, we are rounding out. We've got just a couple more of these left before the end of Q1. Can't believe it. Almost 25% of 2021 already in the books. Uh, pretty crazy after the uh, 29 month 2020 that we faced last year. But uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, as you've seen now, we have a new format for Sales Pipeline Radio. We are still live every Thursday at 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern. We are now doing this as a simulcast on LinkedIn Live as well as on YouTube. Uh, so allowing people to sort of engage with us in real time as we record this. Uh, if you are listening live, watching live, thank you so much for joining us in the middle of your workday. Throw a question in. We're going to be talking about sales management intelligence today the hell is that what does it mean what does it mean for your organization why do you need it uh, any question you've got for myself or our guest brian today uh throw those in if you're listening on demand on the podcast thanks so much for continuing to subscribe continuing to download we're almost at 250 episodes all available on demand at sales pipeline radio Dot com. Uh, we are every week featuring some of the best and brightest minds in sales and marketing in B2B. Today is absolutely no exception. We are so excited to have the co-founder of Ambition, Brian Troutschold. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I had to unmute there. But uh, yeah, I'm psyched to be here. I appreciate uh, speaking with you again. Well, uh, so I, I have to correct an error I made earlier already in the broadcast. It was not a 29 month 2020. It was only 12. It just felt like a million. Um, and we were talking right before we went live, just, you know, not the easiest year to get through. But, you know, look, if you're trying to manage your a sales team remotely and looking for tools to help improve the, your ability to manage that, that had to be good conditions, silver lining for ambition. Talk a little bit about what 2020 was like for you guys. Yes. Yeah, Matt. Well, I thought it was like a 36 month year. So I thought you understated it with 29 months. Um, it, you know, from a personal, from a, from a dad with young kids standpoint, from having to close offices and, and figure out all that, uh, it certainly felt really long. And, and, you know, you mentioned it being 25% of the way through 2021. It's like, man, it's flying right now. And it feels like things are completely changing. Um, you know, even philosophically, I think how people are approaching their businesses now and trying to reinvest and grow, which uh, is super exciting. But you mentioned last year and, you know, people having to learn uh, a whole new motion. And I, I still think we're part, we're, we're in this right now, which is like remotely managing salespeople. And we can, we can figure out what the category of that is or the, you know, what Gartner and Forrester will call that down the line. But you have a, you have a lot of the, the rituals as we've been talking about of how you used to manage a sales team uh, hold them accountable, create culture, get people to uh, ramp and onboard and uh, ultimately meet objectives. A lot of that was in-person or semi-in-person rituals, whether it was like the weekly stand-up or people in a large inside sales floor or you meet up with a manager X amount of times per month for lunch or whatever. Whatever the industry, whatever the type of sales org, a lot of those rituals broke some point in 2020 and a lot of them broke for most of the year uh, and haven't really come back yet. And I think we've seen this, you know, to get into it, we've seen this fascinating change in the customer of um, I would say like early denial, then very rapid, like, can my people even do their job? Like, do we even have the foundational elements to send an inside salesperson or a field seller home and do their do what they did before. Um, and now I think that's mostly been solved for people, but now it is back to this question of like, how do I manage them? How, how do I make sure people are on track and on target? How do I keep people engaged, encouraged? Um, and ultimately, you know, if this is the new normal, which, you know, regardless of what, how people feel it is like, it's going to be hybrid and remote friendly going forward. Um, you know, how am I going to get, how am I going to hit my goals and how am I going to, you know, drive revenue for our organization? Because ultimately that's what sales leaders care about. Um, and, and so it's been really fun to answer your question. It's been super interesting and it's been fun to be, a, you know, high impact as far as ambition right now. Well, I bet it's been, you know, fun just as more people discover the need to have sort of remote sort of, you know, sales management tools. But also I remember, you know, I remember a lot of explicit conversations from 12 months ago, talking to go to market leaders, especially in some of our manufacturing industrial clients saying like, what am I going to do? I got reps that are used to going to someone's office with a box of samples. Um, yep. You know, look, lazy selling in person would translate to lazy selling via Zoom if you just did some of the same stuff. And we are, you're right. We're not going back 
to the way we were doing things before. I think not just because things have changed, but because in 12 months, a lot of companies and a lot of sales reps have realized this is better. There's yep. still, you know, you still benefit from having face to face, but you're more efficient in many cases by doing that remotely. And one of the early indicators we're seeing of that are the hiring trends, both on the sales and the marketing side. Whereas it used to be, oh, we want someone who can, you know, be in the office or an inside rep. Now you got to come in the office every day. Now you're willing to hire the right people with the right attributes, the right values and the right economics almost anywhere, which makes having a platform to manage that more important. Talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Brian Troutschold, who is uh, one of the co-founders of Ambition, which is a, okay, I'm going to make sure I get this right, sales management intelligence platform. Okay, so everyone's working on their own category. There's a lot of different categories within sales. Talk, what does sales management intelligence mean? Unpack that a little bit for us and why that's so yeah. important. Yeah, I hope everyone can see me smile. I don't, I don't know how much of the radio audience you have but versus the live stream audience. But um, it's a lot, right? Like it, it's a lot. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of factors that when we talk about sales management platform or sales, you know, intelligence platform, you know, we see broadly revenue leaders and frontline managers. Th they're dealing with a series of, of new paradigms in the market to manage people. And uh, what I've been calling like up at night questions, the questions that keep them up at night. And the, those challenge paradigms are, you know, I don't think they're super complicated, but everyone's seeing them like distributed work by default. Now, like everyone is going to have to support at some level remote work, whether the role supported it or not before. Um, making data-driven decisions. So, you know, we talk to managers every day who can have a dozen different tools giving them data, but can really get no insight from them unless they go live in these different tools and pull it out manually. Um, people asking, how do you effectively incentivize and hold teams accountable to uh, quantitative metrics, like quantitative objectives and targets? And then um, lastly, and this one I think is, Something that we started to hear a lot more in the, the tail end of 2020 once people were figuring out how they're going to do their jobs. But the workforce is different. It's, it's Gen Z. It's Gen Y. A lot of the managers and leaders are now millennials, which were bemoaned you know, a few years ago. And employee experience and employee expectations are really different. Um, and the type of technologies and tools that they expect are different. So you've got these broad challenges that are meeting you know, whatever type of sales work for the first time. And then you have the common questions uh, that leaders are asking, which is like, especially now that we're remote, like, are my salespeople working right now? Are they effective? Are we going to hit our goal? Is my team on target? Are my managers coaching my reps? Uh, are we going to be able to keep our people? Are our people inspired? The old way we used to do this, if I was asking those questions, I'm in our office right now. There's no one else here. Our sales development team sits 18 feet that way. I would go walk over there and I could talk to a person in two seconds. And while I'm walking over, I'd hear like hey, four different it. calls happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I have no idea as, as a sales leader now, like is, is the 24-year-old sales development rep on our team who's working out of his apartment is he productive? Is he effective? Do I have the the means to not only measure, but then affect that behavior and to, to drive revenue? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you need it. That, that's why we need a platform today. And the more uh, we see managers who are, they're, they're drowning week, week to week by having to pull, own, analyze dozens of reports. And they really just need a system that not only is telling them where do I need to be involved and how do I continually improve and, and develop someone, hold someone accountable, but also give that same level of visibility to the rep and let the rep hold themselves accountable by saying, am I on target? Am I doing what I need to do? Where do I stand in terms of goals or my peers? And uh, put a little bit more ownership back onto these, you know, these people who, you know, I think are going to have more freedom in terms of working from home and being remote and being flexible going forward, but have a high level of accountability. Well, a high level of accountability, a high level of freedom, the ability to um, sort of feel like they don't have someone breathing over their neck all the time watching them. And I think, you know, it speaks to my next question around the difference between managing and coaching, right? I mean, it's one thing to sort of look at the metric and say, you need to make more calls, I need more output from you. But for that 24-year-old who, like, just by definition has not been selling that long, 
they got a lot out of listening to other people sell in the office. They got a lot out of meetings in person, becoming better salespeople. Now from their apartment, your 24 year old, it's a different story. Talk about the importance of coaching for salespeople in general. And how do you do that effectively in a remote capacity? Yeah, we've been investing so much time and effort into our coaching product because we just, we hear it from every, especially at scale organization, the bigger the organization, the more, the more people they have in their sales uh, team, which I'm talking like hundreds or thousands of sellers, it's just hard. And what they know is that it's the biggest lever to improve their results. If they're running an effective coaching program, like if their managers are not just managing to, like you said, did you make 37 versus 40 calls today? But did you make did you make the high quality calls? When you converted a call to a conversation with someone, did it go the way you wanted to? What was said? How did you say it? Did you ask questions that you know led to the right outcome? Um, and that's more on the intelligence side that you mentioned before. And so, and, you know, in mission in our product, we have a robust um, you know a robust workflow that basically takes uh, the fact that you want to do one on ones with the rep. Uh, every week. It puts a format around that, sends it to your calendar, uh, make sure both people are accountable, the rep and the manager, to showing up. Um, It asks reps on the front end information that they need to come prepared with. Like, you know, Matt, what was the conversation that went sideways on you this week? Let's talk about it. What's the opportunity you're most excited about in the last X amount of days? But it also does some pretty smart stuff. And um, we call these metric snapshots. Uh, I think about it, it, it's fixed what, you know, 10 years ago when I would go to a pipeline review with, with my manager and I was the rep, uh, I would show up and I would have to either have pulled all this data or the manager would. They'd be like, oh, I see these 10 opportunities, Brian, you have that are closing this month and are in pipeline stage five for a million dollars. And then you'd go line by line and you'd like try to suss out details and you'd be like this pop quiz, right? And then it'd be like, where's this one? Where's this one? Tell me who, what's, when's Matt going to buy on this one? Um, and we do that all intelligent now. So like intelligently now. So we have the ability to uh, automatically pull this data from the CRM, dynamically populate it into the coaching session. So when you and I, you know, on Zoom or Teams or whatever, weekly one-on-one, which is scheduled by admission, we show up, it's all there. Not only does it tell you, you know, what did you do to your KPIs this week? It'll say, you know, Matt, before the meeting, uh, how do you feel about these 10 opportunities that fit this criteria that are supposed to close this month for this million dollars and put some blurbs in? And we snapshot that. And the powerful thing is that so much we, what we found is that so much time in the one on one is spent catching up on what was happening last time. Oh, what did we agree to last time? You told me you're going to do this thing with so and so company. You're going to call them. You're going to have a contract review. Um, now it's all snapshot and we have action plans from the last call. We say, did you do that thing? Yes, no. Okay, great. Did you not do it? Yes, no. Great. Um, and it's all in line, in order, historically tracked so that the management session is about coaching and like you can talk tactically um, for you know the 30 minutes or whatever you have versus catching up and finding the data and figuring out did the things we agreed to have actually happen. Got time for just a couple more questions today with our guest on Sales Pipeline Radio, Brian Troutschold. He's the co-founder of Ambition, and this is a sales intelligence, sales management intelligence platform. From what you're describing so far, I mean, you know, sales managers, sales leaders, clear value prop for how they can help them manage the team. Why does a chief marketing officer need this platform as well? What can the marketing side of the team of, of the company benefit from having these tools in place? I love that question. We see, One thing that's really interesting, and I'm sure your audience splits, I don't know, 50-50, 60-40, but so often now we see the business development role, sales development role, um, reporting into marketing. It's so tight with the lead generation and lead qualification motion. The pipeline is coming from that side to sales. That's an incredibly hard job. I think in many ways, um, COVID and kind of like changing workforce conditions have made it harder. It's hard to get rejected 60 times making cold calls or, you know, answering inbound calls at home by yourself, not seeing your peers around you deal with some of the same thing. Um, and so you need a, you need a tool that helps, I think, lift those people up and recognize when people are doing great. That's critical on one side. Um, the marketing team, and this is an example from ambition. So, you know, our sales development reps, BDRs, the front end of the sales funnel, it's citizen sales. 
but we pass leads from marketing to that team. So if someone hits our website right now, please do ambition.com. They're going to hit a form. They're going to receive a call from, you know, Joe, who's great. Joe's here at ambition. He's going to call. He's going to ask a few questions. He's going to try to make sure to qualify and best serve, you know, the, the prospect's time. Well, what happens in, in ambition world in a fully remote environment after that call uh, he's going to add some some notes to the record in Salesforce. Matt was a great prospect, five out of five, X, Y, and Z. And he's going to save all that. And immediately it's going to post to Slack, you know, new qualified inbound lead, which was from marketing, this million dollars in pipeline, you know, this kind of uh, SQL data, which we add in or sales qualified lead data. And so what happens is you have this great feedback cycle happening in Slack or Teams or even an email, for example, where, your marketing team is getting the pulse of how their programs are impacting the pipeline generation. And that's just one example, but that, that gives just such a vivid, um, you know, kind of like do, is the drum beat that marketing is putting out there resulting in what they want, which is in most cases for us, people in the market raising their hand and saying, I want to talk to this business. I want to learn more. Yeah. Uh, and we show that directly. I love that. I love that. I think what, what are the, what are some attributes of companies that become some of your best future success stories? And kind of what I'm looking for is, you know, what are the things that for people listening, what are the attributes uh, in their own businesses that if they exist or maybe they don't exist, you know, you see some of the best before and after stories that would make people say, Hey, listen, maybe I should go check this out. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting question. I think one of the things that we've seen in and has been even before COVID, before work from home happened, but like people, companies who are who are making this philosophical shift that um, I think is a little bit, you know, call it generationally different, but that they want to drive really recurring, continual positive feedback to their organization. They want to create a constant stream of that accountability and encouragement. Are you on track? Are you doing the things you're supposed to? When you are, I wanna make sure we recognize you, support you, incentivize you to do it. Mm -hmm. And by creating that feedback cycle as as tightly as possible, make that feedback loop as as, uh, short as possible, they change behavior. And and I say that because, you know, Matt, you've known us for three or four or five years. Like five years ago, if we were talking to an enterprise Fortune 500 sales leader, they would be like, why do I need to high five these people? Like they get commission when they hit quota, they get paid. Like they're cool. That philosophy has changed a lot. And I think it's changed for the better because, you know, quota, maybe it's on a monthly basis at very, at very, I'd say smaller companies at a big company, it's on an annual basis, maybe biannual, maybe quarterly. And so the feedback loop was very long. And so here you're trying to get, you know, continual, um, you know, just continual positive reinforcement of when people are doing something great, they see it, a manager sees it, a sales leader sees it, they feel that recognition. And that drives behavior that sales enablement, sales leader, marketing leader want. Um, And it just compounds. And so I think that's probably, you know, organizations that are looking for, you know, a strong culture of accountability and encouragement. They want to make data-driven decisions looking forward like are we on track are we trending in the right direction um is there is there an area or a person or a team where we need to course correct a lot of organizations look only in the rearview mirror and if you're it's like if you're driving your car and you're only looking in the rearview mirror you're gonna wreck soon enough like you need to be looking out in front um and then lastly like the people who i think really value uh the most important asset, which is talent. And how do we continually engage, develop, um, strengthen our talent, keep our talent? Uh, That employee experience piece, I think, is going to be more important going forward than ever because as remote work becomes ubiquitous, uh, the talent, talent can go wherever. And if you're not, if you, if you're not supporting, engaging, making sure your people feel um, recognized and valued, there's a good chance that or in develop, there's a good chance to leave somewhere that does make them feel that way. And I think that that's another thing that we look for philosophically in a customer who's going to really excel with ambition. 
I love the way you just described that. Just to reiterate some of the things I think that are really important there. I think if you've got a younger sales team in particular, you know, a younger generation that is fed not just on paying the bills, but on experiences, um, you know, having a system of accountability and management is important. But I love the way you described accountability and encouragement to be have something that is encouraging your reps, that's rewarding them for the great work they're doing that is coaching them and providing them with, you know, tools to sort of feel like they're part of a community and part of something bigger, especially when they're remote. Super, super important. I mean, honestly, a tool like that's important, whether you're sitting, have everybody sitting there sort of stage right to you right there in the office, hopefully eventually very soon or continue to rem work remotely. All right. I have one final question for you and it's a bit of an apology. So today, as we record this, a modified version of March madness uh, starts and, <laughs> I have filled out my bracket and you just, just know I'm, I'm a Pac-12 guy and we have not been good at basketball for a while, but Oregon State has had a surprising <laughs> part of the year. And so I apologize. I've picked Oregon State to upset the, the, uh, the number five seed in the Midwest, the Tennessee Volunteers. But it's been a good year for SEC basketball. Like, all, like Alabama wins the SEC. Well, they're good at basketball now as well. Um, they're a two seed, but, you know, yeah. Arkansas, LSU, Tennessee all had good seasons. Tell me a little bit. Um, tell me why I'm wrong and where you think Tennessee's <laughs> going to end up this year. Oh, man. This is like on record. Like, I have friends from college who are going to hear this, man. Um, so I like Tennessee in the first round. I respect the Pac-12. Uh, I think that – that USC is going to be really good in the tournament mm -hmm. this year. Uh, maybe that's not a surprise to anyone. I'm worried about our second round game. Maybe I'm thinking too far ahead of, of Oregon State, but I'm a little worried about Oklahoma State, uh, who I think we'll run into um, in the second round. Mm -hmm. Between you and I, and now between everyone on, on LinkedIn listening, like I watch a lot of SEC basketball games because I'm an alumni of Tennessee. Like I think that – the SEC is a little overhyped this year. I'm not as afraid of Alabama in the tournament or LSU. Um, obviously, Kentucky didn't even make it. I think Tennessee could be fun. We're sparky, but um, I, I'm a little worried about us getting past uh, Cade Cunningham, I think, from Oklahoma State. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got you've got much deeper knowledge than I do. I'm a, I'm a college football guy for the most part. Um, but okay. it's a weird year, not only weird year, because like, it's all going to be played in one state. You don't have those great sort of regional sort of games. Mm -hmm. um, no Duke, no Kentucky. Um, as a, as a Pac-12 fan, I mean, you know, UCLA, no Arizona. Uh, I need yep. a whole nother half an hour to talk about Husky basketball, <laughs> which is a whole nother issue. But um, I'm just, look, I'm just in the grand scheme of, I'm just happy that they're going to start playing games. I'm, I don't watch a whole lot of college basketball, you know, during the regular season, but the tournament is fun. So this should be, this should be fun. Tomorrow and Saturday, I think, are maybe the best sports days of the year. You know, it's uh, it's going to be super fun. Tons of games. You got these small schools taking on these Goliath schools. It's great. It's yep. I love March it. Madness is the best. It is super fun. Well, thank you so much, Brian Chouchold. He is the co-founder and COO of Ambition. Check him out at ambition.com. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Shout out John Flannery. Thanks for checking us out from beautiful San Diego. Uh, we'll be back next week, 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next week.